We're here today at Antibody TV with Dr. John McCafferty, uh, who is the CEO of IONTAS. Welcome, Dr. McCafferty. Thank you. Thank you. And you've joined us today from uh, the Nobel Prize ceremony in Stockholm. That's correct, yeah. What was that great fun? It was fantastic. So I was there really from last Friday and uh, hot footed it here to the, uh, the meeting uh, last night after. Uh, I realised I was up for about 24 hours uh, from the night before. It was fantastic. We went to Nobel lectures on Saturday. Heard Greg Winter, um, uh, Francis Arnold, and George Smith talk, and uh, then the, the various functions, and then culminating in the award ceremony on uh, on Monday evening. Great. great. Well, we're delighted that you've joined you. us here today at the conference. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the work of yours that was recognised at the ceremony? Sure, of course. So basically this year the 2018 Chemistry Prize went to Frances Arnold for the, her work on evolution of enzymes and also shared uh, by Greg Winter and George Smith for feeds display of uh, peptides and proteins. So back in 1988 uh, George Smith published a paper demonstrating um, the peptide phage display. In essence, he was able to show that he could take the gene encoding a short peptide, clone it into the filamentous bacteria phage of, uh, of uh, E. coli, basically a, a virus of bacteria, and it do that in such a way that the, the peptide was presented on the outside of the virus and the gene encoding the peptide was on the inside. Um, so back in 1990, I was one of the founders of Cambridge Antibody Technology, along with Greg Winter and Dave Chiswell, and we wondered whether we'd be able to do the same, uh, the same sort of thing George Smith did, but do it with, by presenting antibodies on the surface of phage. It wasn't uh, obvious at the time that that was going to work. Um, and so for the first five or six months of the uh, company's life, that's what I, I worked on. And I was able to demonstrate not only that we could uh, display a functional antibody on the surface of the phage, but also that we could enrich that phage particle against a background of others based on the binding of the antibody that was presented. So in effect, we were able to uh, use the binding properties of the antibody on the outside to isolate the gene which encoded it on the inside and that's really what the core power of phage display is all about and we published that in uh, Nature at the end of 1990 and that was uh, a paper that the Nobel Committee cited as part of the rationale for the award to Greg. Congratulations on that. Tell me more about how this has helped to lead to the revolution in antibody discovery. Yeah, so, um, I'd say when we started this work, the, the way people generated antibodies was by immunising mice. And, um, and in the beginning, people thought they could use mouse antibodies as therapeutics, but quickly realised that if you start injecting mouse antibodies into a human, then the human will generate the, their own antibodies against the, the drug uh, antibody from mouse. It'll be recognised as foreign. And over the following years, people um, reduced the proportion of the mouse that was present within the drug by simply attaching the, the parts of the mouse antibody that were driving binding onto a human backbone. Um, so that was the sort of state of play when we came along in 1990. And what Fade's display did was unleash the possibility of actually isolating human antibodies directly. Uh, so uh, we were able to make really large libraries and the current sort of libraries we work with in IONTAS, my little company, is around 40 billion members and the, the technology makes it very easy to actually fish in that library for uh, antibodies to any desired specificity. So this technology has uh, gone on to widespread use in big pharma and in biotech companies around the world and already there's been 11 approved human antibodies from phage display. There's a uh, set, set 20 or 30 or so in, in clinic and many more in development within m many companies. And how has the underlying concept been extended to the development of alternative non-antibody scaffolds? Mm -hmm. So antibodies are molecules that the immune system has used. They're basically, uh, one way of looking at them is a molecule with a core uh, framework scaffold structure with regions where it's, uh, uh, you can tolerate diverse antibody sequences. And so the adaptive immune system takes advantage of that and creates within the body millions of different new molecules based on this, the diversity it introduces into these regions. 
And again, before phage display, if you wanted to create a new type of binding molecule, you immunised an animal, as I said earlier. So now, with phage display, we're liberated from the need from immunisation. And so a number of people have uh, come up with the idea of identifying alternative scaffolds, where again, there is a core structural framework, but with the potential to introduce diversity into loops and have reasoned that they may be able to make better types of molecules than nature provides within an antibody. So again, that was, a, I think, an important aspect of this display technology and allowing those sorts of approaches to, to be carried out. Where do you see display technology moving in the future? So I would say in the last 28 years since we did uh, that first publication, um, as I say, it has gone into widespread use in uh, many companies, uh, uh, both big pharma and small biotech. And at the, the meeting here this week, you know, a very high proportion of people are using phage display. So I think going forward, uh, we will see more coming from that. As I mentioned, there's a, about 11 or so approved antibodies more in the clinic. And, and I think we've only scratched the surface actually of the possibilities. And I think in the coming years, we will see many more human antibodies arising from phage display. And in addition, I think phage display has, uh, has sparked the idea of alternative display platforms. And uh, for example, Adimab have a, a yeast display platform that many companies are using. So I think that that's one aspect, more and different antibodies coming. I think we'll begin to see in the coming years the progress of some of these alternative scaffolds that you mentioned uh, earlier on. And again, people are using engineering to create all sorts of fancy by specific type molecules. Um, in the very early days, we were terribly excited about the ability to make antibody molecules uh, to whatever we wanted, and indeed we still are excited about that. But people have also realised in the last decade or so that there's more to it than just generating a binder. You need to be able to produce that, produce it at high concentrations for subcutaneous injection, and it needs to be a stable product. And a number uh, of antibody candidates have failed because of because of this. So I think the, the community is waking up to this so-called developability aspect and indeed there are again a number of talks on that this year. Within my company it's, uh, we've developed a mammalian display platform which gives us uh, very early insight into developability problems uh, so we can identify molecules that are likely to uh, aggregate when we start working with them at higher concentrations or which are likely to cross-react with things that they shouldn't cross-react with. So we're, we're very excited about the possibility of that uh, being a kind of quality filter that may be used to, um, to basically prevent pharma companies from choosing the wrong molecule and at great cost to themselves and we're uh, working with a number and look, of companies in this and looking for more partners in that area. Well, thank you so much for joining us again today, Dr. McCafferty. Uh, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you.